Um, so you're here today, hopefully, for our first session of Wildlife Adaptation Planning and Practices. Um, I'm Stephen Handler. I'm really excited to be here leading this course. I've been in touch with many of you if you've been as you've been registering, but maybe some of you who are parts of teams uh, I haven't been in touch with yet, so I'm just putting a face with a name here. Um, we're going to get started here. Um, I'm going to check our participants. Yeah, we've got 27 participants, so I think we'll just get rolling. And uh, Patricia, please let me know if, uh, if we need to stop and let people in or anything like that. So we are going to be spending a lot of time together over the next seven or eight weeks. Um, you all are here because you're interested in learning about climate change adaptation, how it affects the species, habitats, places where you live and work, um, the clients that you're serving, the public that you're serving, a whole variety of reasons are uh, bringing people here today. We've got a diverse group of people representing different agencies and organizations across the country. And so we're all gonna learn a lot from each other um, and learn together, learn by doing. So that's really exciting for me. Uh, I warned you all about this on our webinar last week, but just in case uh, you didn't participate in that, all of these lectures are recorded. Um, we're gonna follow up each week after lecture with a link to our NIAX YouTube page. You can relive this experience to its full extent. You can share it with teammates who maybe weren't able to participate in this session, or you know, I might be talking to some of you right now who weren't in lecture and are catching up after the fact. That's totally fine. We, we've designed this course to be a mix of live and discontinuous learning. Um, so you know that now, you can use it to your advantage. Um, if you need to play catch up at any point during the course. And there's a whole team of folks who are bringing this course to you and making it possible. And so I want to acknowledge all of these folks now and give them a quick chance to introduce themselves uh, if they're on the call. Uh, so I'll, I'll start just to, to finish. Um, so my name is Stephen Hander. I work for the Forest Service and also the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, or NIACS. I'm based in Houghton, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, Patricia, I see you there. Would you mind introducing yourself? Hey, everybody. Patricia Leopold here. I'm also located in Houghton, Michigan. Um, I'm an adaptation specialist with NIACS, and um, I have been around for one or two of these courses in the past that have focused on general sessions. Um, and so I've really learned the ropes behind the scenes on the adaptation workbook, um, learning management system, and um, I'm happy to help you guys uh, troubleshoot any issues that you're having. So welcome to the course. Thanks, Patricia. Chris, I see you there. Yep, I see you too, Stephen. Hi, my name is Chris Hoving. I am the Adaptation Specialist with the Michigan DNR Wildlife Division. And uh, yeah, I participated um, as a partner helping deliver uh, content for these workshops. I think this may be my fourth workshop. There's, there have been several of them. So I'm glad to be here. Glad you're here. Um, I'm coming to you from, uh, as Stephen said, the, the, the basement of my home working remotely here in Portland, but not Portland, Maine, not Portland, Oregon, Portland, Michigan outside of Lansing. Thanks, Chris. Steve Harris, I see you there with the icebergs. Yep, yeah, I'm here. Hey, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Harris. I'm the district wildlife biologist on the Hoosier National Forest down in Indiana. And I'm detailing in right now to help out Stephen and work with NIACS and work with Patricia. So I'll be, I'm three weeks into the job, be here for another 120 days or so. Thanks, Steve. All right, I don't believe we have Marta or Olivia or Ben, um, but if I'm wrong, please, please speak up. Okay, we'll get a chance to meet the rest of our instructors in your individual discussion sessions, and also we'll be 
rotating responsibility for these lectures. So you will you will get to meet uh, everyone on the on the screen here and lean on us. Um, ask us to help find. Yeah. Yeah, I was just in a meeting with uh, Marta and Olivia that goes for another half hour. They might be popping in late. Perfect. Thanks for letting me know. All right. Um, I went over this briefly in the webinar, but just in case folks uh, didn't get a chance to watch that and aren't familiar with our group at NIACS, we are the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. And we're basically like a climate change help desk for land managers. Um, we started with a footprint in the Midwest and Northeast US. We're occasionally stepping outside that footprint more and more these days. Um, and we basically have a focus on climate change and carbon management. We provide technical assistance, resources, training like this um, to help people make decisions and figure out how best to manage for these two topics. Um, you see our our, uh, our logos on the bottom of the screen there, NIACS is a chartered institute. So we basically have a steering group or a board of directors of organizations that help us stay on course and, and figure out how we can be most useful to land managers and landowners um, representing a, the full spectrum of the land management community. So if you wanna learn more about NIACS, you can, you can visit our website at niax.org. And I just want to say a few basic things that, that sometimes go unsaid um, as we launch into this course together. And it's important to acknowledge that climate change can feel daunting and, and is daunting um, for many reasons. You know? and, and so just to, to connect with that maybe frustration or despair in some cases that folks are feeling, maybe a sense of um, not being sure where to start or how to tackle this problem. We hear this, we hear these, these kinds of feelings from land managers uh, and landowners that we work with all the time. Um, and climate change is a thorny issue because we know our ecosystems are changing and will continue to change. There's nothing, nothing static about wildlife management even more so now um, that we're trying to account for climate change as well. In many cases, the, the habitats and species that you're concerned with are already feeling a pinch from climate change. So this is not you know, a problem vaguely in the future, like it might have seemed, seemed a handful of years ago. Um, climate change has a way of intensifying some stressors and challenges that are already part of your jobs and are already you know, obstacles that we face in our work. Um, so in some ways, climate change is kind of like a, an intensifier or a threat multiplier. Um, and, then, and then on the, on the solutions side, it's difficult because there are no you know, general prescriptions or, or pronouncements that we can give that will, that will solve all problems. Um, it's really kind of a case-by-case -case situation. And, and so problem solving can't be done, you know, really broadly. Um, and at the same time, we know our, our business as usual work might not hold up, might not continue to be robust as the climate continues to change. And so it's going to force us to look inward and kind of examine our, our modes of work, our agencies, goals. You know, and um, think about how those things stack up against the challenges we're facing. All of this feels daunting. A lot of it is new. Um, and so we're going to struggle with, with some of this together. Um, we'll learn from each other. And the point I'll make here is that um, no one can really claim to be an expert with all the answers on climate change adaptation. This is a new enough field that we're all learning together. Um, and so that's a, that's a benefit for those of us who are instructors in this course too, is that we're excited to learn from you all and think about how you're approaching this problem and coming up with solutions. So 
today is just about a little bit of introduction, a little bit of overview to how the course is going to be structured. Um, we'll get into a little more detail on step one of the course and of the adaptation workbook in particular, which is setting up your accounts, starting, um, you know, starting your projects and starting to uh, enter in your goals and objectives that many of you have already been working on. So that's, that's where we're headed today. I went over this in the webinar um, and this was described in our course syllabus. So I don't think this is news to anyone who's made it all the way here today and signed up for the course. But you know now that this course is all about helping you integrate climate change considerations into your real life work. That's why this course is project based. We're asking you to define projects that you're working on or expect to be working on soon so that you can learn by doing and learn in a practical way that is you know, something you're gonna be able to take out of this course and implement or, or apply this thinking to the rest of your job. Um, and so you see the bullets on the screen with some of the specific objectives. Some of you might get to learn new sources of climate change information and help identify climate change impacts that you haven't considered before. We'll all get a lot of practice identifying specific actions to help wildlife cope with changing conditions. Um, you'll put all of this together in a logical sequence, session by session, to come up with your own climate-informed adaptation plan. And then we'll all get some practice communicating through our discussion sessions and, and, and of course, presentations. And so uh, some of you still may wondering, maybe wondering, um, why did I sign up for this? How am I going to balance all this work with my regular work? And, and what am I in for? So just to go over this again, I don't have big concerns about people who are completely lost because you're here right now. Um, so you know, every Monday is our regular lecture time, um, except for our vacation week um, in the middle of March there. So every Monday, we're going to have a session like this where we basically explain the purpose of the next step of the adaptation workbook, show you some of the details about how to actually enter your information and use the online workbook tool to get comfortable with that, answer questions, and then we'll turn you loose to do some thinking with your groups, some homework, complete the step on your own. And then periodically in the course, we will have group discussions. Um, and then those, you, you've all been assigned to those group discussion sessions by now, Tuesdays or Wednesdays. They happen four times throughout the course. Um, this week is going to be a discussion week. So you will meet with your small group, Tuesday or Wednesday. You should already have that calendar invitation from Patricia. Let us know if you, if you haven't received that yet. And so we expect you to attend all of the discussion sessions. Those are not recorded. So we ask that you attend those live, these lectures. We love it if you can attend them live, but feel free to watch the recordings if you need to. Outside of lectures and discussions, there's still going to be some opportunities to check in with your instructors. In some cases, we may be reaching out to you to check in and see how you're doing with each step and if you're getting hung up on any parts of the homework but it should be a two-way street also. So please feel free to get in touch with your instructors. Each of you has a designated primary contact. If you're looking for information, if you need resources, if you have any sorts of struggles, um, if you can't log in and need your password, right? Please don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us with any of that. Uh, I won't go through this in a lot of detail, we, we went through this step by step in the webinar uh, last week, last week that was recorded two weeks ago now, I guess. Um, but in the syllabus, you'll also have a breakdown of the topics each week and a notification of when our discussion sessions are going to be. 
as well as a couple bonus sessions that are happening throughout the course on climate change impacts and adaptation. Okay, continuing to move along. We'll be reinforcing this idea again and again throughout the course of what it is that we're talking about when we use this term climate change adaptation. And so just to, to restate it, we take a pretty broad view of climate change adaptation at NIAX and in our work. And so basically any action you can take to adjust a system, to prepare for the effects of climate change, or to respond to effects of climate change, we would consider that climate change adaptation. The critical point is that adaptation actions are designed intentionally to address climate change impacts. So it's not just assuming that your business as usual conservation activities or stewardship activities are also supporting climate change adaptation. Adaptation depends on being a little bit um, systematic and identifying this is an impact that I'm concerned with. Here's how I'm choosing to adapt to that so that there's a, a clear um, train of thought that connects a risk to an action. And the other thing we stress again and again about adaptation is that you're not just adapting for the sake of doing something different. Adaptation action should be designed to help you meet your goals and objectives. And this is why we spend so much time hassling you all about how you're articulating your goals and objectives at the beginning of this course, because we're gonna use those goals and objectives as your North Star again and again, come back to those and say, how does climate change affect your ability to achieve this goal? Is this goal really the fundamental thing you're trying to accomplish? And, and if it is, then let's figure out maybe another way to get there or a way to supplement your business as usual action to help you meet that goal. So the, the goals and objectives are really fundamental to deciding how you're going to adapt. And then again, just because we're talking about climate change now does not mean we expect you to rip up everything you know about wildlife management, habitat management, everything you've learned over the course of your careers. We're not expecting you to start from scratch. In many cases, adaptation will build on the work you're already doing uh, for wildlife management, conservation, habitat restoration. So we'll look for those win-win opportunities where, um, where what you're already doing dovetails with climate adaptation. I mentioned this earlier, we're not here to provide uh, an answer or a guidebook on here's what you must do, thou shalt do A, B, and C to adapt to climate change because we know every situation is different because of the people or the organizations involved and their values and cultures and risk tolerance. Places have different vulnerabilities and exposures to climate change. Two land managers side by side um, with adjacent properties may still have very different goals and objectives. Um, and then everyone has different resources and practices that they can bring to bear on climate change adaptation, whether that goes to funding or equipment or time, um, you know, everyone's capability is a little different. And so all of this, all this will customize everyone's um, most logical course for climate change adaptation. Everyone, everyone will have a, a kind of a self-determined best approach. So this process that we're going through and the tool that we're using to help you all identify your path forward for climate change adaptation is called the Adaptation Workbook. Um, and I'm showing a couple Links in the bottom of the screen here, there's a, you know, a, a published book called Forest Adaptation Resources that contains the adaptation workbook and descriptions step-by-step -step and examples of how to use the adaptation workbook. 
I would encourage you all to go there, download that document for a, a deeper dive and a, a richer discussion of each step. And then all of us in the course here will be using the second link at the bottom of your screen, adaptationworkbook.org. That's our online interactive self-guided version of this process. Um, both formats share a lot of things in common. They're, they're not recommendations, tools, op very open-ended, like, like we'll stress again and again. Um, and they, they really rely a lot on your expertise and judgment um, to complete the process. And so these are the five steps of the adaptation workbook that our course is structured around. And so we'll be, we'll be moving through these about a week at a time. Um, although we've already spent a couple of weeks, including all, all the prep work you all have been doing on this first step, defining management goals and objectives. Next week is where we'll really dive into some new material um, asking you all to assess climate change impacts and vulnerabilities. You'll be going out and digesting information from a whole variety of resources um, to think about which climate impacts are most pertinent to your place and your management situations. The third step is all about critical thinking um, and deciding whether the goals and objectives that you have articulated are still feasible given the climate change impacts that, that you discussed in step two and that you have um, thought about at that point of the, the workbook. And so that's an opportunity to really cement your rationale for, yes, I am confident these goals and objectives make sense and I think I can still achieve them, or no, I have really, um, you know, I have really uh, uh, strong concerns about the feasibility of some of these things and I may need to reframe or re revise my management goals and objectives. Um, the fourth step is where we'll get creative and brainstorm. And that's where we'll do our biggest amount of problem solving about how to adapt. And we'll use a, a tool called the menu of adaptation strategies and approaches to help with that brainstorming and creativity. And then lastly, closing the loop, we'll spend some time thinking about monitoring and assessment which I know many of you are already thinking about, right? We heard a lot of discussion about monitoring and evaluation when you all were designing your projects. Um, and so we know that's already, um, that's already kind of front of mind for many of you. And it's really important. It's an important part of this adaptation process is deciding how will you evaluate effectiveness down the line? How will your, your successors know whether they should continue with this course or whether they might need to change course in the future. Um, so uh, look for that at the very end. If you wanna know more about what this looks like when the dust settles, I would encourage you all to spend a few minutes looking at our website, forestadaptation.org. That's where we're keeping a, a growing collection of case studies that show real world examples of land managers with real goals and objectives, just like you all, thinking about climate change risks, deciding their own course of action for how to adapt. And so we're, we're summarizing all these real world adaptation case studies. Um, and then we hope that many of you will choose to share your projects and your examples so that the whole wildlife community can learn from our neighbors uh, and see what, see what your peers are doing. And just to give you a, a brief preview, um, I pulled one of our wildlife focused examples from that, from that uh, library that I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and I just wanted to give you a, a quick snapshot of what this looks like and kind of some of the solutions that this project group had in mind after they wrestled with this process. Um, so this is an example from middle of Nebraska, the Central Platte River Valley. Um, 
we held a workshop in 2019 and a, a group of people from the Crane Trust and the Nature Conservancy and University of Nebraska Lincoln and the State of Nebraska uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife came together and um, they identified this section of river corridor along the Central Platte River that um, was still vital migratory habitat for cranes and other wildlife. And so they, they looked at maybe a 15 mile section of the river corridor. And first, like you all know, we, we went a couple rounds with them and had them articulate their goals and objectives, which you see here on the screen, goals being broad statements of a desired future condition, objectives being more specific, quantifiable statements of how they're going to actually achieve that broader goal. And so, you know, you see they're looking at kind of the balance of woody cover versus meadow cover in this riparian corridor. They're looking at the, the form and structure of that river channel that makes it valuable for cranes and other uh, migratory waterfowl. And then also they're looking at some agriculture focused objectives <clears throat> to actually demonstrate an agricultural advantage, a production advantage in some case um, for some of these practices that they're interested to test uh, and some land cover objectives. So uh, that's where they stood, kind of more or less where you all are at now. Um, next up, the adaptation workbook is thinking about priority climate change impacts and how those impacts affect their project area. And so we, we had some guest presentations and had the group rate um, some regional climate impacts and talk about how those impacts translate to the river corridor and the habitat values that they're trying to manage for. And you see a top five list um, that they selected for some of their largest priority climate impacts. This is some work that you all will be doing next week to get to this point. But you see, it's not just how is the climate changing? It's actually thinking um, with a lot more detail about what is a, what is a general climate trend mean for you know, your particular property, your particular landscape, um, in some cases, your particular species that you're managing for. Um, and then jumping ahead to some of the adaptation actions that they came up with. Um, they came up with a couple different bins of adaptation actions. I'm just going to show you two. Uh, the first, they came up with some interesting agricultural practices that they wanted to work with farmers and ranchers along this riparian corridor, and do some uh, demonstrations of these practices. <clears throat> And then to complement that, some additional conservation practices to expand um, the riparian corridor in some space, uh, in some, some instances, or place some key parcels under permanent protection from development. And then also some, some stewardships and management, uh, grazing um, in targeted areas, doing prescribed fire in different seasons of the year to boost floristic quality. Um, and so actually paying attention to how they can improve the quality of that habitat aside from just protecting it from development. This is just a snapshot of some of their thinking. I'll be coming back to this example in more detail as we move through each week to show you again a little more um, under the hood about how they thought about each step of this adaptation workbook process. But again, this is just a little foreshadowing of um, a group in your situation and some of the things they came up with through this process. So I'll pause here really quickly. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of using 
the online adaptation workbook. Um, this has been a lot of me chatting. Do you have any questions about the purpose of the course or the structure, the timing, anything like that? You can feel free to speak up or put your questions in the chat. That's great too. Patricia or Chris or Steve, is there anything I've glossed over that, um, that I should come back to? I can't think of anything at this point, um, but definitely just remember to hit your unmute button if you want to ask a question. Okay. I'll keep moving, but um, yeah, please put, uh, put questions in the chat if they come to you. Okay, so you know, this week, our main objective is working on step one, and that's defining your project location, goals and objectives, um, those things. And so, like I said, we've already been working with you all on these key questions. Um, we spent some time on the webinar. Um, many of you saw this live. Some of you might have seen the recording. We talked about finding the, the Goldilocks zone or the sweet spot for a project that is going to be not too complex, not too simple, um, kind of a comfortable number of goals, objectives, ecosystem types, or management units, depending on how you're categorizing your, your project work. Some of you I have already seen, you know, you've, um, you've spelled out your goals and objectives, but you've, you've designated a couple as a priority so that if for whatever reason things get overwhelming and you need to streamline, maybe there's a couple goals and objectives that you're more comfortable getting rid of and coming back to later on. So I feel like many of you are, are on the road to finding that, that Goldilocks zone here. Um, I've also seen a uh, big improvement in how you all are distinguishing between goals and objectives. And I realize this was probably new terms uh, for many of you. And so we're, we're forcing you to redefine um, your work according to, you know, to our, our language here and our process. Um, so you know that those goals are the broad statements of a, a desired future condition <clears throat> and the objectives they sit underneath those general goals, and those are the concise, measurable statements um, that kind of lay out, here's the game plan, here's actually how we're going to achieve this broad goal. Um, some of you, I know, are working with existing management plans or planning documents, and so I know some of you are, are grabbing from those. That's perfect. That's what we encourage. Some of you might be working in a situation where you don't have a uh, an already published management plan or, or species recovery plan or something. So some of you are having to maybe put these words down for the first time. We also talked about how there's a relationship here. Each goal has to have at least one objective, but a goal can also have many objectives. So you can have, you know, three, four, five objectives that all relate to a single general goal. And we also talked about how you can create some categories for your project if that helps you organize your thinking here, these management topics. Um, we'll come back to this, but some of you might have a goal or two that relate to uh, a specific habitat type. And then you might have another goal or two that relate to a different habitat type on the same property. And so we'll call those management topics um, that allow you to you know, create some, some tracks or some categories that you will follow through, uh, through our course here. When we get into actually using the workbook, uh, some of you may have already 
created your accounts and started some projects, but in case you haven't, I'm going to give you a preview of what this looks like um, to complete step one on the adaptation workbook. So assuming that you've all been able to log in and create an account online, if you haven't, please email me or Patricia, let us know if, if anything is hanging you up there. Um, so when you sign in, you'll come to your project dashboard, which looks like this. It'll be blank because you haven't created a project before. <clears throat> um, and so now at this point, you can hit this add a project button. Um, let's see, let me make sure that you're getting my mouse. Yes, are you getting my cursor here? So that's great, add a project button. Make sure that you're adding this project for Adaptation Planning and Practices Wildlife Management 2022 course. You'll create you know, the, the profile of your project, dropping a pin on the map to identify where it is. You don't have to be super precise on the location, but get it as comfortable as you feel comfortable. Um, add a short description for yourself size, ownership, and also make sure that you choose the wildlife management project type. That'll be important later in the course. And then you'll come to a, a welcome screen. It welcomes you to the, the tool and the process. Um, you'll have some drop down pages that appear on the screen when you start each step. Uh, many times there will be a video link that you can click on to get a tutorial of that step. And also, this is important, and we've noticed that this can be a big problem for folks. You should see this little carrot icon, which is the button you click to roll up that menu or roll it down. If you don't see this little carrot, let us know because that means you're probably missing a lot of other icons in this workbook. There's a, there's a troubleshooting thing here we can do with your web browser, um, but that's something important. If, if you're just seeing kind of blank space here and you don't know how to get rid of this annoying menu, that's a sign that we need to check your browser compatibility. You'll also have a, you know, in addition to uh, uh, kind of a welcome menu for each step. You will also have a menu that is specific to our course agenda, right? So that's another check to make sure that you've associated your project with our wildlife management course. You should have this menu up at the top of your screen, course agenda and notes. Again, look for the carrot to get rid of it. And then also, um, just to orient you, you'll have this menu toolbar or this, um, what do I call it? A menu on the left-hand side of your screen there. That's another place to track your progress through the adaptation workbook and to bounce around to different steps. Okay, after you have created your project, gotten rid of all the menus, I mean, you've read the instructions in detail before you've gotten rid of those menus. Um, then you'll come to this project summary, the progress summary page. This is a, a landing page that you'll come back to again and again. And so I just want to make sure that folks are clear um, with using this. It gives you a quick status indicator for each step, one through five of the adaptation workbook. So when you're just starting, you'll see a lot of those red hazard triangles. Don't be alarmed by that. That just means that you haven't completed that step yet. Um, you'll also see a, a right-hand panel that's kind of like a, a little more detail about each step. So right now we have step one highlighted. And so this is a little more detail about what has been completed or what is missing in step one. And again, you see red hazard triangles because I haven't completed my management uh, topics or goals or objectives for this project yet. 
And again, you can bounce around to get more detail about any of these steps in that left-hand menu. So what are we asking you to do in step one? There's two parts. Step 1.1 is defining those management topics. Like I mentioned, these are categories that you can choose um, to help segment your project idea, just in case it's useful to you. And so you, this is kind of um, however you choose to skin the cat here. Um, for my example that I'll be showing you, uh, occasionally throughout this course, you know, I may have a management topic on wolverines and I may have a management topic on waterfowl. The point here is that each topic has one or more goals. Each goal has one or more objectives. So there, there can't be any orphans here. Um, same thing with waterfowl. I have at least one goal and at least one objective. This is important. This topics thing is important because your final adaptation plan will be organized according to those topics. So if you create a topic for my riparian corridor, that'll be one section of your final plan. And if you create a section for those upland game birds that I want to pay attention to, that'll be a different section of the plan. <laughs> Depending on where you mark the location of your project. The adaptation workbook might suggest some potential topics that you can choose to use or not use. Um, we, we have already pre-populated a lot of forest specific information in this tool because that's our history at NIAX is working mostly with forest managers. So depending on where you put your project, we may suggest some forest cover types as potential management topics. You can choose those or you can not choose them. Uh, I expect many of you will not choose those because you're not working in forested systems or you're defining your project in different ways, not just by forest habitat types. So most of you <coughs> will be using this add a custom forest type or management topic button. This is what most of you will do. And when you click that button, you'll get a little pop-up window and you just give that a short title and then add a description if it's helpful to you. Save those as you go. And then you will see those populate here on the right side of this screen. So the management topics that you are actually working with show up here on the right. You see my wolverines and waterfowl. When you're done choosing topics or creating topics, you can use this um, next arrow here to advance to the next step, or you can, do, again, make use of this uh, left-hand menu to bounce to the next step. After you've created topics, and you're doing goals and objectives. And at this point, most of you will just be copying and pasting goals and objectives that you've already created in those worksheets because um, most of you uh, have already got a, re a really nice um, set of goals and objectives. So again, those red caution triangles, those indicate, okay, you don't have any goals and objectives here yet. Um, so in this second part of step one, You'll click each of your topics, and then you will use this add a goal objective set button to add a goal and objective for that topic. See here what, what this starts to look like. You're creating goals, and you're adding objectives under each. You can add objectives nested within a goal, and then when you're done with that, you add another goal and objective set. <clears throat> so at least one goal, at least a, one objective for each management topic. Um, just a 
final refresher. We are covered this in, in the webinar about goals and objectives, but please feel free to rely on goals and objectives you already have from those management plans or stewardship documents, species recovery plans, anything that already exists is a perfect starting point for this course. Your goals and objectives don't need to, they don't need to state your desire to adapt to climate change. We'll be doing that later on in the course. Um, your goals should look into the future. You know, your goals are those general statements of your desired future condition. And these should all be related to wildlife. They should have a clear wildlife outcome. So your assignment for next week, finish reading the course syllabus if you haven't already. Create your account on the adaptation workbook. Complete step one, putting in your management topics, goals, and objectives. And then there's going to be a homework section following step one. Let's go back here. You'll see this for each step of the adaptation workbook. There's a, a homework one, homework two, homework three. That's just a series of short questions, um, short answer, in some cases, radio buttons, uh, multiple choice. Um, it shouldn't take very long for each step, but it's a little bit of a, a check for us to see how you're coming along and for you to let us know if you're having problems or if you have questions. So we ask that you complete that homework step by next Monday, Monday morning. That gives us time to check in with everyone's homework before our next lecture to address any hanging questions that are coming up. If you finish the syllabus, enter in your goals and objectives, complete the homework, and you're still feeling like, I've got more time, I want to work ahead a little bit, um, step two is a bigger lift. Step two will take more time. Um, and so we have some starter resources for you in the syllabus to start exploring climate change impacts and thinking about how those impacts relate to wildlife. That's something you could do this week if, you're, um, if you wanna start moving ahead. Next Tuesday morning, so the morning following our lecture next week, we're gonna feature a special bonus lecture from Chris Hoving. It's going to be a, a broad overview to highlight the many ways that climate change can affect wildlife, um, so beyond habitat. Um, and so Chris will be giving us some, some examples from around the country, um, showing us some resources that will be valuable and taking questions um, and hearing from you all. Maybe this is a chance to ask Chris, hey, I've always been wondering about this. Uh, X, Y, and Z, so, um, oh geez, yeah. March 8th, I'm still living in the past. Thank you, Kara. Um, I, I swear the correct date is in the syllabus. Um, and it's the same link that we use for this lecture and all of our discussion sessions. Chris, is there anything else you'd like to say about that um, bonus session next week? It'd be a lot of fun. Thanks for agreeing to do it. Okay, Patricia or Steve, have I missed anything? Geez, I'm living in the past again. That should be Monday, March 7th for our next lecture. My fault. Sorry, Hi. folks. Time just keeps going by so fast. I mean, it's I don't like it. March tomorrow. Um, I would just reiterate that um, what, you, what you said about making sure to link your project to the adaptation planning and practices course is the single most critical step that you need to take. Um, and if you have questions, we can help you out with any 
other obstacle you're facing, as long as you make sure that you have clicked that button and then on the next um, slide, Stephen, that you have uh, chosen wildlife management as your project type. Um, that's not as critical as, as the first part, um, but it's still going to iron out a lot of um, difficulties for you if you if you do hit that button. Um, and uh, hopefully by the end of today, I will be sending out another newsletter that provides the reporting to today's session and also a copy of all of these slides. So if you wanna go through these again, um, you'll get the PDF version of the slides to do that. Everyone at this point should be receiving that weekly newsletter I've sent out two newsletters so far for the wildlife adaptation course. If you have not received those newsletters, check your spam folder, please. And then add us to your trusted contacts. If you're still not receiving the newsletters, please email me, check in with me, and I will make sure that you're on our contact list or otherwise figure out what's what's going on for you. So don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions at all. Okay, uh, looks like Pammy might not have received the newsletter. Um, Pammy, will, I'm pretty sure you're uh, Patricia's contact. So maybe the two of you can chat about that. Yep, it should come from pleopold at mtu.edu. Um, so uh, check your spam folders. And then um, another issue that might be going on for some folks is if you have multiple email addresses, you may have signed up um, to register for the course with one email address but um, you might primarily use another email address. Um, so if you need to change um, which email address is your, your primary contact for the course, let me know and I can make that happen as well. So email me, um, email me directly if you're having um, issues getting the, the newsletter. Um, and I'm gonna type my email address into the um, chat box. Thanks, Patricia. It looks like looks like looks like Linnea and Austin and Michael might also be looking for that newsletter. Um, let's see. Going back up the questions here, I see Sharon. You had a good question. Um, should you send your final goals and objectives to your uh, instructor contacts? I think that's a good idea. If if um, yeah, if you're taking the time to write them down, I think that would be good to send it to your, your instructor contact um, because then it's one more opportunity for us to check. But uh, from what I've seen, I think um, everyone is coming along, uh, coming along and ending up with really good goals and objectives. And I'm, I'm writing folks' names down that have not received the newsletter, but definitely email me directly because it might turn out that I just don't have your email address and then I won't be able to contact you to help you figure this out. Okay, so email me. Um, Melissa, um, if it's... So some folks have not been able to use the Google Drive to upload step one. Um, if you are one of those folks, you can feel free to send an email directly to your project contact with those goals and objectives attached. My preference would be though, if you are able to post it to the Google Drive, that way all of our instructors have, has access to the most up-to-date version of your project. So in case any of us need to step in for any reason. Um, we just have one place to look. Could you send a link to the uh, Google Drive again? I think I 
far as I know, the only place I've accessed it was to the registration, so it might be nice to save it. I can include a link to the Google Drive in the newsletter that I'll send out um, this evening or early tomorrow. Thank you. Then you'll have all the information in, in one place. Good questions. What else is on your mind? Yes. It look, well, as I looked at my objectives, it looks like I have objectives and actions mixed together. Do we just want it to be the objection, objective and not even think about what actions we take to get there yet? No, in some, in some cases, objectives will, will have your actions. In fact, in many cases, they will. Thank you. Um, so, so if that's all right, um, if you're concerned about anything, you can, you can uh, let us know, but I expect you're okay. Okay, thank you. And Hillary is asking, what should we expect in our first discussion session? You want us to just show all of our cards right now? <laughs> um, no, uh, it will be um, it will be a pretty easy on ramp. We will be doing so. There are three discussion sessions, so expect that each discussion session has seven project groups, um, and so that'll be your little pod that will be together most consistently throughout the course. So we'll be doing actual introductions. You all will get to speak to each other and share a little bit about your project, the place you're working, the goals and objectives you have for that place. Um, we'll talk a little bit about whether you're comfortable with your goals and objectives as they are. If some of you are still tweaking with some things, that's a chance to ask more detailed questions about this is how I'm phrasing it and I'm not sure if this is exactly right. You know, so that, that's a um, it's a two-way street with us, the instructors, but also your peer group um, that's part of the course. Um, also a good opportunity um, to, to do any troubleshooting. So after you get off today's lecture and start tackling information in the adaptation workbook, um, if you have any feedback, we can cover it then. It is three o'clock though, so I just wanted to do a time check in. We don't want to waste anybody's time, so um, if you need to leave, definitely you can hop off, um, but Stephen and I will stick around um, to answer any additional questions that, that folks might have. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll do a I'll add to that. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for being here. If you want to stick around and ask questions, Patricia and I can, can stay and hang out. But um, we've started. We're on the road together. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Stephen. I think uh, Cara had a question. Yes, I see that. Um, uh, yes, if you, Cara, so Kara, if you have, um, if you think it's going to be a conflict from multiple discussion sessions, we'll put you in another one. If it's just one, then yeah, we can flip flop you for, for one week. That shouldn't be a big deal. Um, let's see. Okay, thanks folks. <laughs>